We are live as always. <laughs> How are you today, Martin? I'm doing awesome. I just wanted to ask you. Well, first of all, I'm wearing a red shirt, but I'm in a red room. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to point out that this is a different room. This is a definitely different, but it's an awesome room. It's pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible, yeah. Do you think Usher doesn't know how incredible this room is? No, he doesn't know. <laughs> but we're like in a new studio today. Yeah, brand new studio, pretty nice. Big. Big, yeah, much, much bigger than ours. Much well, bigger than the original yeah. studio. Square table. A square table. table. It's like a, it's like an epiphany. <laughs> yeah, finally. <laughs> Why would anybody put a round table in a studio? <laughs> That's right. Makes no sense. Yeah. Makes no sense at all. Should we should we welcome Usher to the we to should. the room? Let's do that. Usher, it's very nice to have you. Usher Ismail, see? <laughs> well, thanks see? so much for having me and for getting my name right. That's yeah. great. So, looking, looking forward to the discussion with you guys. It says it on your shirt. So it's it's as you would say in the UK, it's on the tin, but the co-founder or a co-founder of Uncapped, it's great to have you here. You are in London, no? I am based in London, um, but I'm originally from Canada. Spent, okay. And, uh, you know, it was supposed to be for 12 months and ended up being 12 years. Yeah. And probably the one thing that hasn't changed is the accent. That's interesting. Yeah, that's super interesting. I was supposed to be in Japan for two years. I was there for 22. So kind of the same type of thing, yeah. So if you were in Canada, can you speak French? Un petit peu. Un petit peu. <laughs> Un petit peu. So should we do this <laughs> I think that's probably French? all I can say. That's, that's all about I can all remember. you get. I'm a little bit out of practice, guys. <laughs> no, so Martin and I go back and forth on multilingual podcast. We did, yeah. So it's not really Martin just wants to speak French. He's from France. He wants to turn this into a French podcast. <laughs> I'm trying to push my but it's that. not going to happen. <laughs> anyway, how are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, it's a beautiful day in London. We've actually been having a bit of a heat wave, so that's a that's a nice change. And uh, and yeah, but also excited to chat with you guys. It's really good to have you here. Can you give us maybe a little bit more of your background just for some context before we jump into the main part of this conversation? Yeah, for sure. So, so as you said, you know, I'm one of the co-founders of Uncapped. And what we're really passionate about is that founders shouldn't have to give away equity in order to fund growth. So you know, we provide fast, flexible funding to e-commerce businesses for marketing, inventory, hiring. But the key thing is that we do it without personal guarantees or dilution. And, uh, you know, my background is in startups. This is the third business that I've started over the years. And the biggest problem I always had was getting the funding that I needed. And now, you know, working with hundreds of e-commerce founders, I've just seen how they've really struggled too. So for me, it's a dream to get to work on Uncapped because, you know, every day is about helping other entrepreneurs get the funding they need. And um, our first customers were actually my friends. So from the start, we really tried to create a product that is really friendly, that's fast, fair, transparent, you know, it's the product I wish always existed. Uh, we're now in 22 countries, including the US, the UK, Germany, Poland, Spain. Um, you know, our business has been growing exponentially, deploying hundreds of millions of dollars. And we actually now fund more businesses in a day than the typical VC will fund in a year. So what were you doing before this though? What other kind of businesses did you start? Yeah, well, you know, Uncap is really just born out of the frustrations I faced when I was launching my first business, uh, which was way back in 2003. And, you know, I was young and I was just trying to raise 100K and I probably had 100 meetings and got 100 no's. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to take financing from the banks because they all wanted personal guarantees. And, you know, with venture capital, it wasn't ideal either because, you know, I didn't have a track record or connections or like a warm introduction. And so I just repeatedly was like missing out on growth opportunities. And, um, you know, so that was my first business, that was like a marketplace business. And, you know, I realized marketplaces are really tough to run, but, you know, um, I ended up making a small exit on that business. And, and I thought, okay, what should I do next? And I ended up actually, you know, doing a second business and I was raising money for that. And I thought, okay, now, you know, now I have it all figured out, you know, and I ended up raising millions in venture capital, but then I also got terribly diluted. And I just started to realize the options for me were really limited. And it was just depressing, you know, to think that I could work so hard and then own so little of my company. Where and were you? I, were you in Europe or in the UK when you were raising this money or so were you in Canada? My first business was back in Canada and my second business was in the UK. And, you know, I think uh, it probably a lot happened in, in all of those times, I think, of, of, you know, the world kind of changing and getting used to a new ecosystem that was here. But um, my second business was, was more in like the fintech insurance space. 
Um, and in that, you know, uh, you know, London became like the, you know, the fintech capital of the world in some ways, I'd like to say. Um, but, you know, I made so many friends with other founders that were in, you know, in the e-commerce space and actually invested in a ton of businesses around that. And yeah, I just started noticing that, you know, basically the problems that I was having, it wasn't just me, right? Like every growing business was just left to choose between raising this costly venture capital or burning themselves with traditional debt. And so, yeah, I just uh, thought there must be a better way and, and start to work on Uncapped basically to try to bring this more like fair way of funding. I think, you know, first, first to Europe and, you know, now to North America. And why do you think it's so hard like this whole process of raising money from VCs, why do you think it's so hard? And, and also this, like I advise companies on raising money, right? So I get it. And one of the things I tell them is one of the lessons that I tell them to learn is about dilution, right? In other words, if somebody wants to give you money, particularly at the earliest stages of your business building that dilutes you so much, don't take their money. It's better to be destitute and poor because because at some point your interests are going to diverge from theirs if they own too much of your business, particularly early on. Right? Like 10 years in, if you own 10% of Uber, maybe that's okay. But if, if you look at the most successful businesses, the guys and gals that have founded them have maintained their ownership stake and even created interesting products so that even if they don't own all the equity, they own all the voting equity, right? So that's the Facebook model. But yeah, what's the problem? Like, what, what, what do you think the problem is with that model of just going to VCs to raise money? Well, it's, I think, as you said, you know, um, in each round of VC funding, you're typically giving up 20 to 30% of your company. 20%, yeah. But you also give up control. You give up a board seat, usually. And, you know, once you give away that equity, you can never get it back. And so, you know, I don't think it suits every business. And for some cases, it's just really silly. You know, like, for example, if you're a founder who's running an e-commerce business and you're planning to raise a bunch of equity, spend probably like six months doing it, but then turn around and spend that money on Facebook ads where you already know that, you know, one pound in is like three pounds out or, you know, $3 out, then, you know, that's money that you would have just had so instantly, but now you're never going to get that equity back. And so it's just a crazy game. And if you keep doing that game, you end up going to the point where actually you own so little of your business. So like, that's like the fundamental challenge of why it just doesn't make sense for you know, marketing, but also doesn't make sense for inventory. You know, there should be a way of funding that's like more aligned to the use case. Yeah, definitely. And I think particularly in, in, in the e-commerce space, because like when you need money in e-commerce, most of the time you need money yesterday, because, right. like, because you need the inventory, you need to like, you need to do much more, more, more marketing, like, uh, like right now because you have an opportunity or because it's because it's because it, it's you four or because like one of your com competitors just struggled or something happened yeah most of the time like this is the moment where you get to go bigger on marketing or like your initial campaign start to work in very well and you want to grow and this is really at, i guess at this growth stage that's you, what you are coming in right it is not for early early com companies it's more for companies who want to grow and who have and we need capital right now to fund the growth right yeah. So like, you know, we say like uncapped is great for you. If you're doing at least 10 K of monthly sales, you've been doing it for six months and you're growing. And like our rationale there is basically when you get to 10 K, you know, you've gone to a place where, you know, this is not just side of desk anymore. You're actually maybe earning enough where you could take a bit of a salary from that. If you're doing that for six months, you've shown that actually this is, this is a real thing. People want this product and there's growth there. And like, what we want to do is help those businesses that really just want to take it to the next level. You know, they want more fuel for the fire without taking a piece of the pie. And what's your and capital you know, source? We love. What what's your capital, capital source? source? So, yeah. you know, the funny thing is that we raise money so other people don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, we have raised millions, millions of equity from actually from VCs, some of the best VCs in the world. Um, but I think the way we think about it is that you know, um, we're an alternative to VC, but you know, it's not that VC necessarily is like a dirty word or a bad thing. It's just one tool in an entrepreneur's toolkit and you just got to know when to apply it. And like, you know, when we encourage people to use equity is when they're investing in something that is, you know, doesn't have product market fit yet, that it needs R and D hasn't figured out that monetization model. That is a great use of equity, right? Because that's an equity bet. You're going from zero to one. But when you're running an e-commerce business and you know that if you buy this inventory, you're going to be able to sell it in three months, 
and you've seen that pattern again and again, it's insane to basically go and give away 20% of your company. And uh, that's why we would say that's not a good use. Yeah, so I agree with you. What's your view on companies like e-commerce aggregators like, come on, Thrasio or Opuntia and stuff like that? Guys that raised literally in the United US a billion dollars and guys in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia just raised millions of dollars. But their idea is to then go buy these companies to then scale. But they're raising VC money as well. Some of them are raising debt too, right? So this, it's interesting. But I'm curious what you think about those businesses at scale because you're so involved in the e-commerce side of it. How does it look to you? Yeah. So, I mean, we've seen, it's amazing how much those companies have raised in the last period, especially last year, there was just a wave of Insanity. company after company. And you were like, right. whoa, what's happening here? But I think it shows this pattern and that, you know, it shows that for e-commerce businesses, it's a good thing because it creates another exit route for them, I think. And, you know, previously, you know, if you wanted to build an e-commerce business, there was always a question about where, where's this business going to go, you know, and if you're getting into that next level, what happens next? The, the model for them, of course, is like super different because they're more thinking about how do they aggregate these businesses and then optimize them and get a return and drive it that way. And actually, we also work with some of those partners. So, you know, we help fund those guys as well and, you know, give them capital to go and support other businesses and great cross relationships. But our main customer and the people we're really passionate about is like, how do we help more founders? You know, and for me, that's where I started, right? I was a founder. I was stuck. I couldn't get the funding that I needed. And so really our core customer and the people we most want to help is actually those people who can't act, act with sec, access equity. Because when you think about it, there's incredible inequity and equity, right? Like we didn't even talk about that. Like 0.05% of companies will raise venture capital and 98% of them are men. So, you know, we're in a world where there's so many great businesses that are just not accessing the capital they need to grow. And if they did, there's so much more opportunity and, you know, I think missing out on that is such a shame. So let's talk about the equity and equity. It's a really good point, right? I mean, people, there are a lot of statistics around the number of women that get funded, right? Two to two and a half, maybe 2.7% of all VC money goes to women. But that doesn't include, you know, people of color or the LGBTQ community or all these other businesses that should potentially get funded. But are you particularly focusing on those as well? Well, the way we work is that, you know, we break the bias because, you know, it's not like, you know, you meet with us and have to do a pitch and you show us a business plan and, you know, have a bunch of coffees with us. The way we work is that we connect the data sources that you already use to run your company. So we connect to your Shopify, to your Google, to your Facebook, your, you know, accounting, and we get this 360 view of how your business runs. And we use that data to make a near real time decision without the bias. And because of that, it means we fund way more diverse founders than, you know, a typical VC would because businesses are, are overlooked. Is that automated? Do you know what I mean? In other words, like you could be sleeping and fund a business. If you've got a hundred million dollars in your war chest <laughs> and you're connected to all this data, right? I connect you to my doctor tech data. I connect you to all my sales data, whatever it is. You could literally, because you said you fund more businesses in a day than most VCs fund in a year, which is a super cool thing to say. But at scale, you could literally do this when you're sleeping, right? Because you have, you must have certain metrics that you're using and, to and measure. And we do yeah. actually have a deal when we're sleeping because of how the markets that we support. So you know, we do we use a lot of um, automation and data science. Some people like to call these things AI, but you know, really at the end of the day, we're just using you know, some, some fancy math and some calculations to make, you know, good decisions based on the real quality of the business. We do still involve people though. I think one of the things about our business is that we really believe in giving like a great like service experience and working with the computer to get your answer about your funding isn't the way to do it. So we also, you know, make sure we try to understand every founder and understand the intricacies that might not be in the data. But, um, you know, a key part of how we've been able to do it is really by being data focused in a way that I think VCs just couldn't be because you know half of our team are, are engineers and computer scientists. Right. That's interesting. Which is so funny because the top line on my little note thing here just says data driven. Yeah. That's the only thing. It was the first thing I wanted to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We love to talk about being data driven. <laughs> um, but this is but this is even more interesting. So let me ask you this: for all the for all the companies that come to you that meet the sort of data criteria to get funded, right? The ones that don't, if you really care, it sounds to me 
and I think it's hard to fake this actually. It sounds to me like you care. Like that you really, that you, I haven't met your co-founder, but there's no way you can co-found with somebody where you really care about it. And the other founder just like, I don't really care. Well, this is just money in, money out. Who cares? But if you really care about people, right, there's all, there are all these people that are close, right? Or just haven't cracked the nut on e-commerce, let's say, since that's what we talk about. Do you also help them? You know what I mean? And just say, you know what, if you just did this or marketed this way or didn't do that thing, or maybe change the you know what I'm talking about, right? I don't want to say consulting yeah. per se, because it's not that straightforward, but then help them to get to a point where, boom, they meet the metrics for six months and then they can raise money kind of thing. So one of the things we like to say is that we're you know, the, actually the smartest money that a founder could get. And the reason why is because of the data insights that we have. So you know, for founders who, we, who do have debt funding, we consult with them, we talk to them about how they could optimize their business. You know, we see you know, hundreds of businesses a day. And so that helps us get those insights for them. But also for the businesses that we decline, that we aren't able to fund, we talk to them about why. You know, what are the challenges that we're seeing in their business? What are some of the opportunities? And we stay in touch. So, you know, if they, you know, keep their data connected to us, we can then, you know, be in touch at the moment that they do reach, you know, the criteria where they are ready for that funding. And often I think, you know, when a business doesn't get funding, it's, you know, we're, it's not that the fact that they're, um, they're, it's also, you know, some ways it can be a service to them. Because I think a mistake that founders can make is also putting capital into a business that isn't ready for capital yet, right? And so it's also sharing with them, what would you need to do to get your business ready to get it to scale so that you don't pull this up? You have something that's on the edge of working. Let's really help you make it work. And then let's grow it together. So is there a part of, like, let's say I'm an 18 year old. There's always an age joke coming, always. <laughs> I didn't say anything. But so always, an, I'm just silent. waiting, right? So I, I silenced myself just to wait for I it. Stay doesn't matter. To me. Today. I stay silent today. I stay silent. But <laughs> let's say I'm an 18 year old and I'm really interested in e commerce and I come to you or maybe I come to your community of founders and I say, like, what do I need to do? Where do I need to get to get to this thing? Do you know what I mean? Like, really from the beginnings, right? So I understand people connect their data, they're just not making it. But is there a way to advise people, you know, you, if you're data driven from the beginning and you're accessing all this data in real time, probably and processing all this data, the more data you get, the smarter you get, the smarter your investments get, the better they get. And over time, that data feeds off itself, right? If you're running the right sort of data analysis, you can kind of know what will and what won't succeed, where the trends are, what's going to work and what's not going to work. If I just came to you and said, look, I want to start an e-commerce business, you kind of must have all this data around like, okay, but make sure you do it in this way kind of thing. And then come back to me, connect right away to me. And in six months, if you've hit these benchmarks, you'll know that you've either succeeded or failed. And if not, we can then guide you again on how to do it from the earliest time. Yeah. Does that make sense? You know, it's funny, like, you know, in the very early days of running this business, you know, I'd underwrite these businesses myself. So, you know, I'd be like talking to the founders myself. I'd be like analyzing their data, putting it into spreadsheets, looking at the sheets and, I've actually just looked at so many businesses now that, you know, once someone's connected to our data, you know, by seeing a few graphs within you know, about 10 minutes, I can tell them exactly how much funding they're eligible for, what they need to do, how they compare to their peers. And like, you know, it just starts to become like ingrained in your brain. So, so yeah, I think there are incredible patterns and we have been able to help founders in that way. Like, you know, like one of our first customers um, was this sustainable fashion brand called Hedwin. And just like so many e-commerce founders that work in fashion, they just had to struggle because they had to juggle cash between inventory and marketing. And they say they have to wait until the current season sells so they can invest the returns in the next. And, you know, that just limits your growth, right? And I'm sure you've seen so many businesses that are just stuck in this, this cycle, right? And so, you know, Alex Nana, who are the founders, you know, they, you know, want, they want to look at like every option. They're talking to VCs, trying to think about how to do venture debt, all these things. But I think what they realize is that, well, actually what matters most is do you get an affordable option, right? And so they signed up with us. They got an advance of like 50K at the end of, you know, at the end of the year. And then they use those funds to invest in inventory. And then with that funding in a single quarter, their revenue grew 11,000% compared to the previous year. And so... To me, like that's the models like we love to see because it just shows if you take, you know, the right business with the right founders and then you enable them with capital they just couldn't otherwise access, you can just achieve amazing things.
you know? And so like it's situations like that where like, you know, it gets you up in the morning and you don't want yeah. to help more founders achieve things like that. So how long is Uncapped been around? So we're just over two years old, Got if it. you can believe it. No, no. So this is definitely the fastest company that I have ever been part of. <laughs> I think just maybe reflects, you know, maybe not, not necessarily our skill, if I'm honest with you. I think reflects the fact that this is the new way to raise money. And, you know, I think people have woken up, they've gotten fed up with the existing models, and there was just incredible demand and pull from the market. And we were just there at the right time, so, the right idea so can I ask, to go and execute. Yeah, can I ask you this? E-commerce, I understand. And it, it makes perfect sense to me, but it's also has, <clears throat> it also has all of these existing sources where you can grab the data, right? So you build an API, you connect to Shopify's API or to Dr. Tech's API or whoever they're using, right? To Wix or to Woo or whatever it is, yeah, that they're doing. Yeah. That's really straightforward. But there are entire countries, right? Like Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Germany, where, you know, 70, 80% of the economy is driven by SMEs that don't use those type of platforms to to run their businesses but also run into the same capital shortfalls so i'm curious on two levels one is is there a business for someone to create that all of those businesses can sit on that then generates data that then feeds into uncapped so that then you can fund them as well so that they don't run into the same capital constraints do you know what i mean because yeah. because your model works right regardless of whether it's e-commerce or like somewhere on Mars, it just doesn't matter because you're just doing a data analysis on, do you have enough cash flow to fund this? And if you do, will it create growth? So does that make sense? In other words, should somebody go out and build that other thing yeah. as well? Like, I think you definitely have to consider like what the technological advances have been that have made alternative finance options feasible, right? Like, I don't think what we do would have been possible even in our core markets, just like five years ago, because like our analytics platform it's what allows us to judge risk far more accurately because we have those connections, you know, we call API connections to all those different platforms. If it wasn't the fact that e-commerce founders typically, you know, 80% of them are using, you know, five things mainly to run their business. If that wasn't the case, yeah, it wouldn't be possible to have a business like this. And so um, there's been a major shift and, you know, I think that's going to keep coming and, you know, we're, we're seeing to see that evolution move around the world. So, you know, we want to be there with those founders. I think Asia has so much stuff happening in this space and like, you know, there's going to be more development, more growth and, you know, options for capital are also going to spread. And that's a great thing because it used to be if you weren't, you know, based in like one of the centers like London or New York or, you know, San Francisco, you weren't where the investors were and it was so much harder to get capital. But actually there's been a, you know, a democratization of capital because now it's online. And, you know, any founder, you know, sitting in the world potentially can access this new source and actually do it at better terms, probably than the founders could previously. So what are the rules and the regulations around? So you've raised, uh, and I'm generalizing just based on the stuff that you've said, right? So I'm only talking about the things that I know based on the things that you've said, right? But if you raise money from venture capitalists, I'm going to pick a number, let's just call it $200 million, which you can parse out in $2 million pieces, 2 million pounds. It doesn't matter to me, right? That's great, but there's this difference in the world between credit, you know, accredited um, investors and non-accredited investors, right? Based on net worth and a whole bunch of other silliness, as far as I'm concerned. But it means that if you believe that your data analysis and the, and your metrics and your benchmarks work, is there a way that you've created that other people can then invest in the things, particularly on the debt side, right, where interest rates globally are zero, right? but you're not lending at zero. You're lending, I'm guessing, somewhere between six and 8%. I have no idea. But if you are, <laughs> but, but if you are, can I invest in, in an entity then that will allow me to then fund you so that then you can fund the other entrepreneurs? Or is that, or do the regulations not allow that because of the accreditation? Well, it's less about the regulation. I think it's more about the belief of like what makes a good lending business. So, you know, one of our beliefs is that if you go to a marketplace model, like what you're talking about, where the person who is giving out the capital is separated from who is supplying the capital, or, you know, you're in a situation where you're not, but we, we're a balance sheet lender, where basically we're taking, you know, we're getting capital, we're taking that capital and we're deploying it. It changes a bit of the rule of the game because what happens is, you would get, if you have a marketplace business in that world, you know, you're always incentivized to grow your business as fast as you can, right? 
And the easiest way to grow your business in lending is by making lots of risky loans and taking on a lot of bad debt. And in a marketplace model, who suffers? It's the people, you know, the potentially the consumers, the retail investors, the, you know, the, uh, you know, individuals who go in and, you know, are maybe blindly following that, thinking they're going to enter into a good investment, which eventually breaks, right? So in our world as being a balance sheet lender, we always have to make sure that we're never giving out a loan that we don't think the person can repay. And for us, that creates the right incentive cycle where we have to be cautious, but also we're also doing right by the founders because we're not pushing people into bankruptcies or getting them to do things that wouldn't be right for them. We're actually hopefully making the right choices on both sides. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I asked the question the wrong way. If I can come up with, me and my friends can come up with 10 million bucks, can I give it to you so you can lend it out? <laughs> That's what I'm asking. Well, right? that would can be I a different back? story. So, uh, <laughs> Say it again? That could, di- that could be a different game. I guess it potentially if you were investing as like an equity investor, hey, let's uh, let's chat after this. But uh, ah, I think that's, I a, that's a slightly okay. different game. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand. I'm just trying to understand the model, right? So can I ask yeah, this? Yeah, well, Go ahead. Oh, well, you know, obviously, you know, a big part of this is that we are growing really fast. So yeah. you know, we've raised multiple, you know, multiple rounds. So we raised round after round and actually some of the biggest rounds that have been in Europe. Um, because of that. So, you know, there'll, there'll be another one, but, uh, you know, we'll let you know. But does your valuation go up when you raise more money or is it just more money to then deploy? Like I'm trying to understand the relationship between the money that you raise and your own business profitability. Right. Right. And then, because, you know, a normal bank, they, they take deposits, right? So they can then take those deposits and lend them out. And then they can, of course, um, leverage them to a certain extent but their valuation doesn't necessarily get higher every time they take a deposit. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You know, we have multiple things we raise. So one part is we raise equity and of course they raise at a higher valuation. Cause if we did not we would just be getting diluted yeah, to a place where it wouldn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's that, but we also raise money from hedge funds who supply us with, you know, really large streams of capital. And we work with now, some of the best providers in the world. I can't tell you their names because we signed some NDAs. And I can like guess. That. I can guess. But, uh, you, can, you can probably guess. You I know, can definitely guess. Heard of. And, uh, you know, those folks are really quality folks that you know, <laughs> give us the hundreds of millions that we need That's to, you know, to. make the number of investments that we're making. Say hello to my friends at Citadel and Tiger. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but, but it's a very, so this is a very interesting business model. This is why we love to get guys like you on the show. It's because this is the thing that's really happening undercover that most people don't see. Mm-hmm. That's why it's so interesting. I want to ask you as well, as the financial system really starts to um, iterate, is there a kind of DeFi opportunity here for you? And is there a tokenization possibility too, where you can then fractionalize some of the investments that you're making and then make those things once the investments get made tradable. So you're really creating like a multi-sided market for this stuff. You're not the marketplace itself, but the tokenization then provides a fractionalization opportunity to then make it available for others as well. Well, you know, so far that hasn't been part of our strategy as well, just because of thinking a little bit about like the privacy. So of all the information, like when, you know, founders work with us, they're sharing their data with us, which is obviously really sensitive. And so the way we're thinking about that information and, you know, that particular founders, um, data and the insight and the opportunities for them, it's just between us. And so kind of some of the challenges of like going to marketplace models or you know, opening up things in other ways means you also have to tell people, well, what are you investing in exactly? Right. Cause that's kind of the key question and they want to understand the underlying detail. But of course, that removes some of the confidentiality that happens between founders. And yeah, and I guess if you give, I guess if you give the founder the choice, like you know, we can widen the opportunity for people to invest in no. you if you're willing to disclose. If not, you don't have to, kind of thing, right? Fair enough. I, I just think that most founders, if you ask them that question, they are really protective of of their case and their situation for, for the overall opportunity. So it hasn't been, to us, it just hasn't been a priority for us. Like our priority has been thinking, how do we serve more founders in more ways? How do we create more flexibility in our products so we can, you know, serve them in the way that they really want to be served? And yeah, how do we access more markets so that, you know, more entrepreneurs can get, get capital where they're missing out? Yeah. And is there, an, is there an opportunity for you as a team, again, with all of this data that you have to then start seeding yourself? So taking some of the money that you raised to seed some of these entrepreneurs and founders that then feed them into your funding mechanism to take advantage of some of the equity upside? 
So I would love to do that. You know, it's interesting with our business in the early days, we were, you know, only funding businesses that were like at hundred K plus. Right. Then we did, you know, at 25 K plus monthly sales. And yeah. you know, now we do 10 K monthly sales. So <laughs> as our data and our models have gotten smarter, we've just been able to figure out ways how to fund companies earlier and earlier in their journey. And yeah, I think that would be like the next evolution for us as well. Yeah. Because it's just so interesting, right? Like you raise money from venture capitalists, so other people don't have to do it. And at some level you dilute yourself. But smartly, right? Because obviously you've been through this a thousand oh, times, yeah. so you know how to do this, right? But yeah, but then we're using that money for that R and D to, you know, yeah. figure out the next wave, do something that no one's done before. And yeah, yeah, for that equity is a good bet. No, but I love this, right? I always say the venture capital money, because fundamentally, an early stage company, and you're still kind of early, even though you're very successful, is just a fund and experiment. And if you're experimenting and you're succeeding on some of these models, the idea then is to disintermediate the people that are funding the experiment and then take your own, the money that you're earning directly and invest it into other parts of your business that you think will be more profitable for you to remove your own dilution and then grow this into like a massive financial services business or even an e-commerce business or wherever you see the data leading you, right? That's what's really interesting to me, yeah? Yeah, there's so it's so interesting about where you can disrupt along you know that value chain. It's funny, even when we were talking to VCs, the conversation was a little bit awkward because yeah, it's like, yeah. hey, man, you want me to fund you so that you can disrupt my business. Right. Model. You want me to you want to you want me to fund you so you can take away my ability to invest and dilute other people. Okay, but, here's you know, my money. Funny. Exactly, right? But the smart VCs, I think, get it because they know that disruption's coming. Yeah. So are you gonna be one of the VCs who's like ahead of it and is like leading the pack and actually mm -hmm. making a return? Or are you going to be the guy who's like, you know, left standing when the music stops, right? <laughs> right, right. 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 Just, like, if I, if I interrupt you very quickly, go. like, like, because when we want to provide a return on investment for your investors or for your own company, then the, the people that you invest in need to pay back the loan that you, that you are giving to them. So I'm really, really, really wondering. When, when I listen to all your conversation about finance and, 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 and all of this stuff, it's super interesting, but I'm really wondering, like, what is the time frame that you asked your funders to pay you back? Are we, are we talking in months? Are we talking in years? Like, what, what is the, yeah, the, the duration of the loan? Yeah, so most, so the way this model works, by the way, it's, it's revenue-based finance, right? So we take a portion of your daily sales until the capital is repaid. If you're not generating sales, there's nothing to pay. So there's no fixed term in terms of, you know, the timeline to pay. It's very different from a traditional loan where that kind of is the definition of a loan, right? Is that you take a certain amount of money, you have to pay it by a certain day. This is a, a more flexible way of thinking, first of all. But there is a rate that, you know, which people repay. So like typically most founders are repaying us within six to 12 months. And, you know, sometimes um, people pay us back slower because, hey, we got the forecast wrong and we thought their business was going to grow faster, but it didn't. But that's OK. You know, we took that risk and that's the that's the, the you know, the reason we exist. Um, on the flip side, sometimes businesses grow way faster than either of us thought. And, you know, they end up paying back sooner. But that also means that that entrepreneur has actually built probably a much more valuable business in that time period. And, hey, we can turn around and then fund them again. And if yeah, like the key thing, of course, like in your building e-commerce, how to think about the value of your business, it's typically a revenue multiple, right? So if you can figure out a way to get a cheap source of capital and then grow your top line, you've made your business more valuable and more investable. So what's your revenue multiple? What's our revenue multiple? Not um, yours. In other words... So again, and this is public, right? So we spoke to the founders of Opontia, right? And one of the, and the guys said to us, like, we try to buy businesses at four times revenues because oh, right, we think right. we can value them at the multiple four times. So we think we can sell them at 11 times, right? So where do you think these businesses should trade since you have all the data? <laughs> well, so, you know, that's different from our business because, you know, we're not- I know, I know, I know, but I know I, I'm asking you just a separate question, but like, what do you think? In other words, if you're increasing your multiple, what should it be? Uh, well, you know, I, I think you know, that range is actually the range that I've seen. I think, uh, you know, I've, this year, in terms of companies that we work with, we've seen companies that have had an exit that's been as low as a 1x multiple. So we've seen a company that did a 12x multiple. So, you know, that's a, a really wide range. I was actually, um, you know, talking to the guys at Quiet Light, 
who specialize in this as well. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. So they specialize in you know, selling e-commerce businesses. And, you know, they're kind of telling me a similar thing in terms of like the range of companies they're seeing. It kind of falls into that map. And so, you know, it shows what's possible, though. Like, it's kind of, uh, you know, insane to think that companies could be getting to such high val- high revenue multiples in terms of valuations. That was unheard of, I think, in previous periods. And I think people, you know, have seen that there's ways that companies have just created so much growth and potentially maybe a lot of hype to be able to get to that level. But yeah, the way we're funding is a little bit different. We're, we're really thinking, how do you do it in the non-equity way? How do you think about, you know, instead, you know, maximizing the quality of your business? But I think this is a, I think this is a secular trend, actually, and, and I'll tell you why. I think in the old days, if you were building a business from scratch in your small town, you'd go to the local bank and beg them for money. And if you couldn't do that, you would go to your family and go, this is, come on, I made this thing. It's this widget. It's definitely going to sell. Grandma, just give me $10,000 and I'll figure it out. And once it did sell, <laughs> yeah, exactly. we all have grandmothers. Somehow they all seem to have money. Um, but, but the point is that once you got that growth and you could go to a bank and they'd say, sure, if you've got six months of this, that, and the other thing, but now it's global and data is ubiquitous and the access to that data is instantaneous where in the old days it wasn't. So that means that somebody in... Thailand can get funded by somebody in Surrey because the internet connects them to each other. But because the venture capital business was built around, hey, I've got a billion dollars and you don't, but that's a great idea. I'll take 15% of your company if I give you $10 million was okay because that person was never going to get money from the bank. But as the entrepreneurs get smarter, And as the financial system sort of collapses around this idea of being able to give debt to people as opposed to giving up equity, that whole thing is going to change back to the way it used to be in the old days where you'd family and friend fund the beginning part of it and then debt fund the rest of it and not give up so much equity. Does that make sense? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's the evolution. And debt used to be like a dirty word because at least in Europe, like- Well, everywhere, because a VC would ask you, like, do you have any debt on the books? You're like- well, maybe, but isn't that okay? Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it felt like, you know, somebody, if you took debt, people would ask you, oh, what's wrong? Like, yeah. what's going on? Right? Where being, raising equity or raising like a major round, you know, you get celebrated in TechCrunch and everyone's like, oh, wow, you must be an amazing founder. <laughs> yeah. But the funny thing is that true success isn't raising a big round. No. It's building a profitable business and exactly. owning more of it. Exactly. And so, yeah, founders, I think, are starting to wake up to that, especially when you talk to any second time founder right? They will tell you that lesson and it's hard earned, right? So I think we're just trying to encourage more founders to, to, you know, realize our mistakes, you know, and uh, hopefully, you know, keep more of the business. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah, that's super cool. And on top of that, as you just take your share of the revenue, then like there is no like time or monthly repayment that I have to pay at the end of the month, right? Like if my marketing campaigns work super good, then I can pay you faster. Everybody's happy. If it works a little bit yeah. less good, then oh, I don't have like this, you know, this some dude coming, some, some dude from Brooklyn <laughs> coming to my house to like. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But yeah, and the other thing is, there's a flat fee. You know, our model we have a six percent flat fee, and the thing about that it means that you know exactly what you have to repay. So you know, if you if we lend you a hundred k to spend on marketing, we take back you know a fixed portion of your daily revenue until we get a hundred and six k back. And, you know, we're not taking any equity or personal guarantees or warrants or hidden fees. You're just paying that 6%. And, you know, I think for me as much for like the challenge always was like, how much is this really costing me? You know, when you would like be getting your compounding interest and trying to figure all that out, this is super simple. And, you know, in terms of like the return, like we were talking a bit before about like people getting like return on ad spend. There was, there's those entrepreneurs who are like, do I want to pay 6%? They're like, I don't know. But then if you talk about <laughs> it, they're like, well, what's your alternative? And then, you know, the alternative would be like, okay, um, I'm just not going to raise any money. Right. And, but what happens then is say if you have a, a say the three X return on ad spend, you take 6% from us as a fee, you're still getting 2.94 versus zero, <laughs> you know? So why wouldn't you take 2.94? So it's just an interesting thing, like about mindset, like people always have thought debt's a sturdy word, but actually if you use it in the right way, you can be incredibly smart. 
I have seen PayPal and Stripe doing that, so like directly from the dashboard, you can get a loan from Stripe, and they, they say the same thing. Like they say, like, hey, we give you like ten thousand dollars, for example, and we just take a share of your revenue until you pay us back. Uh, I have no idea of what what's the fee of PayPal and Stripe because I, I didn't go further. But like, are they competing with you? Like in other terms, like, do you have founders who come with you and say, hey, PayPal and Stripe gave gave, gave me that? So are you going to give me a better terms or like our prepared and trap solution are not super used and they don't compete with you at the end of the day? You know, when those products launch, my investors came to me going, oh my God, what's going to happen guys that these <laughs> products are launching. And then what we realized was no difference. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why is because those products, they are much more expensive. And the reason why is because they can only use the data from their own platforms, right? So if you're Stripe, you're using Stripe data to make that decision. If you're Shopify, you're using Shopify data. We're connecting, we have a hundred different ways that we can connect your data. So we connect to all your revenue streams, right? So you're probably using Shopify and Amazon. Plus there's a bunch of other insight that's in your bank account and your accounting and all those things justify that actually you're probably eligible for a lot more capital than Shopify thinks. And therefore we can also do it at better terms and overall, you're getting an opportunity. And what it actually did for us was it meant way more people started going, oh, interesting. There's this other way to raise capital and started becoming aware of the product and then started coming more to us. So thanks a lot to the team at Shopify and Amazon. <laughs> <Keep doing the laughs> for work. advertising for my business. <laughs> advertising us because like, yeah, we'd love to, we'd love to, we love it. And uh, yeah, I think it's great. And it just helped this, this space explode. I'm a big believer that when Amazon or Google or pick a big company that focuses on X and does X really well goes into Y business, it just means that somebody else is going to do that business better. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I mean, and so, uh, look, I've got one of the largest insure tech podcasts in the world. And, <clears throat> you know, every time Google hires somebody to disintermediate the insurance business, incumbents just get nervous and insure techs just go bring it on baby because you're never going to be able to compete with us kind of thing so i get it yeah yeah it's the focus and the focus of execution of just knowing this it's like incredibly hard to build a credit business but also do it in this world where you're actually also building like all that data and that insight and still trying to stay true to really understanding your real customer and, and doing it with the right mentality and our mentality has always been like how do we be founder first you know, we're not just founder friendly, we are founders ourselves. Yeah. I, mean, I think that just changes the way you play the game. Yeah. And this gets back to what you said before, right? Like I can, I can probably borrow money from Google at scale, but who do I call when something goes wrong? Do you know what I mean? There's no one there. Yeah. Totally. And you know, and that's, that's, what's amazing too, right? Like, you know, we know the entrepreneurs that work exactly. with us. And so they contact us. We, you know, they're, they're, you know, so many of them are our friends. So it's cool <laughs> that they're like still using the product, you know, and, uh, you know, and, uh, so we haven't come after them with any like baseball bats or anything, you know, <laughs> they came back, <laughs> they wanted more funding and, you know, then they've gone on to be our biggest advocates and that's actually how we grew. So like, you know, was that we created like what I like to call like a, a six star experience. Yeah. You know, we, when we first launched this product, people were like, how the hell are you going to get capital for a 6% fee, mm -hmm. you know, to these like young entrepreneurs, right. And like the product seemed insane as an idea. And so that stimulated people to go, wow, this is possible. I got my money in 24 hours. And then they told a whole bunch of other people. And then that just created this like wave of more and more people coming to us. Are you surprised? And so yeah, are, you, us, are you surprised by how fast this has grown and how big it's gotten? Well, absolutely. Like, you know, I think compared to any other business that I've had, like, this is incredible, but we're also, you know, we were named the second fastest growing FinTech in Europe. Right. Um, just recently by Sifted. So stuff. yeah, I think even by other people's accounts. <laughs> they're also really surprised. Fast. Who are these guys? <laughs> they're also surprised. They're also surprised. And, uh, you know, I think what I was saying before, it's, I don't think it's just about us. Yeah, yeah. We're so great as founders. No, no, I, get it. I think we learned, I learned a lot of lessons about how to build a business by making some really dumb mistakes. Um, but it's also just, there's real demand for this thing yeah. because this is the way founders should be raising capital going forward. Got it. Anything else? Yeah, that's super interesting. I was wondering, like, with all the data that you have about e-commerce, like, you know, uh, industries, ver 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 verticals and all of that, like, do you sometimes have a proactive approach? Like, we want to invest into an apparel co company. So then you're going to look for a company that is great, that did not contact you, but you are going to be proactive and go to contact them. Does that happen sometimes? Yeah, it happens all the time. Oh, you know, I the think time. in the, in the <laughs> early days. We just like put out, you know, a message and like put a little PR story. And then actually in the first day that we launched, 
we had 400 people apply. Okay. And it was actually crazy because we were totally not ready. So we didn't have like a CRM or a database. <laughs> we had a well, pen. I had to like phone one of my, one of my old, one of the guys who used to work with me at my last company. And I just like called him at 9 PM and I was like, dude, I need help with this database. You know, something about pipe drive. Can you like come in tomorrow and you like set up our pipe drive? Pipe and it drive. Like, took us ages to be able to get back to everybody because we just didn't expect it, you know? And then, you know, obviously the evolution has been, Hey, we, we figured that stuff out. So now we have a very good, we have a good system, right. but also then we started to spot the opportunities yeah, yeah. and realize who is a really great customer for us and then go after them proactively and try to build relationships and, you know, connect with guys like you, and, you know, more people in the ecosystem and hopefully, you know, build our brand. So it creates like a, you know, a nice positive feedback loop where, where people are coming to us again and again. That's super good. And I think a lot of conversation that we had on this podcast was about like e-commerce companies willing to go into another region. Like, uh, for example, a company in the US want to expand into the EU or companies in Asia yeah. want to then start selling in Europe or in the United States. Do you fund this kind of growth? Or do you, yeah. no, you don't. Why not? Of course. Oh, you do, that, of course. That's, okay. that's a great thing. If you have a model that's working and you realize there's an opportunity to take it to another market, like, hey, that, that's a really smart thing to do. Because if you think about it, e-commerce businesses by definition are international, right? Like if you think about, um, if you compare an SME in, you know, within the UK, who's working on an e-commerce business versus like a mom and pop shop versus comparing those two e-commerce businesses in two different countries, they have way more in common, right? Than just being in the same country. So the ability to, you know, use these platforms to underwrite them, to make, help them grow, that's way more similar. So it's a fabulous thing for us. When we see an entrepreneur who wants to go to a different market, we have a lot of insight about that, right? So we can tell them, Hey, talk to us, let us consult with you. Let us help you think about how to do that expansion. Here's what you should expect. And we can model that with them and then give them the capital they need to do it. So who are your ideal partners? In other words, like, shouldn't Ricky be working with these guys? Yeah, for, for not, but I was... Uh, I That's was what you were thinking, thinking, right? About them, yeah. Same thing, right? But who are, your, <laughs> who are your ideal partners? How do you expand to other regions? Like, how does that look to you? Well, you know, um, it's interesting. One of our partners has been VCs themselves. So we have a network of 600 VCs who refer their portfolio to us. Right. Okay. Which sounds crazy, but the reason why is because they don't want to be diluted either. Right. So once they've invested, they're like, shit, okay, you took money from us, but don't take money from anybody else. Take some money from Uncast that's because so basically strange. it means we'll all own more of the business. So that's been one of our main streams. Oh, really? <laughs> and so we built this great network. That's terrible. But then anyway. it's also, we've built partnerships uh, just with uh, you know so many other folks in the e-commerce space who I think are doing great things. And kind of one of our beliefs is like, we want to make like, you know, that like value add where, Hey, we're giving you capital, but like, what else can we do to help you grow? Because if you grow faster, our incentives are fully aligned. We also get paid back faster. So let me introduce you to, you know, the right agency who could help you. Let me introduce you to the right email marketing tools. Let me introduce you to, you know, software that we've seen our other customers, you know, use to really improve their supply chain. And so we keep doing those things. And that also means founders, uh, you know, like us even that much more. And, uh, yeah, it creates a really nice dynamic. You could introduce them to the best e-commerce podcast in the world, and then they could get global exposure <laughs> in the over a hundred countries where we have yeah, listeners you know, and watch it and, and <laughs> I have do to figure it. Out who that is though. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can find those guys for you. All right, cool, cool. Send me an email after this. <laughs> Okay, well, look, maybe we should end there then. I think that's a, that's a perfect. <laughs> I don't want to get insulted this, this again. <laughs> <laughs> it's with love, guys. I love it. I love, love it. it. No, I love it. I love it. Asher Ismail, a co founder of Uncap, that was kind of awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you very much for coming on the show and for sharing all your experience and what you see in the increment space. That was super. <laughs>